Okay, fantastic. We're over 120 participants. The recording has started. I'm going to hopefully uh, share a screen with you. That will be a slideshow presentation. Uh, very brief from me. It's just an introduction into what today's session is for. We're talking about bid rigging and the dangers in procurement and what you need to know. Uh, obviously, we've had a lot of uh, webinars and roundtable group discussions and uh, communications with organisations around procurement fraud lately. And what we at SIPFA like to do is take the information and the concerns uh, and the issues that are being ra raised and provide you with an opportunity to attend workshops and webinars and sessions in order to discuss the issues. Um, we are joined today by Mohammed Hans. He's our Procurement Network Advisor at SIPFA. He has a wealth of experience, is an expert on the European public procurement rules and a developer of uh, many widely used practitioner toolkits for SIPFA that's used across uh, the public sector. And uh, gratefully today, Richard Brown, who's Assistant Director of the Cartels Enforcement at the Competition and Market Authority, who will be presenting uh, to you as well. We're hopefully going to get uh, some information on what procurement fraud looks like in the public sector, maybe in the wider context, but more importantly, what the biggest current future challenges are for preventing bid rigging. Uh, what best practice guidance or tools are available to detect and prevent bid rigging from occurring and what we can do about upskilling the workforce with the limited resources we've got in our procurement teams and across those that, that manage procurement processes. And hopefully at the end we'll have some time um, for answering any questions that you can put in the Q&A um, functionality and we will talk about how the public sector can best protect itself from bid rigging what role central government may play in enabling or assisting local government, and what role does SIPFA have for the wider procurement fraud prevention agenda. I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. We're going to start off with our uh, Mohammed first, who will hopefully be able to share his screen and take over. I'll be in the background monitoring any questions uh, that, that arise. So over to you, Mohammed. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, colleagues. Hope everybody's keeping uh, well and warm. Um, I've been given an op uh, opportunity to, to speak to you today just to give you a set the scene in terms of our main session today, which is going to be on bid rigging. But I thought I'd just set the scene in terms of procurement fraud in a, in a more wider perspective. As, as colleagues will know, I mean, the UK spends approximately £300 billion on public procurement every year. I mean, in terms of the global procurement spend, it's about $13 trillion, uh, which we spent on kind of contracting for goods, works and services. It about, amounts to about 12% of global GDP. So it's a huge, huge sum of money. Uh, and with so much public money at stake. Um, if you could move the slides, please. Uh, before I go into it any further, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Procurement Commission Network. It's a practitioner kind of forum um, where we have kind of scheduled events on a regular basis, also provide advice and technical advice uh, and kind of various publications. And we've got some really interesting set of events coming up early next year. So please go to sit for website where you'll get lots of information about procurement generally, as well as the procurement network as well. Next, please. So in terms of, you know, the, the huge public uh, amount of money that we spend on procurement, uh, it's inevitable uh, with the 300 billion pounds that we spend annually that we're going to attract organizations and individuals, unfortunately, with ulterior motives. The, the point is that, you know, what we're trying to emphasize today is you know, where organizations do not have strong and effective controls, it's going to be a lot easier, you know, for somebody to take their chances through public procurement uh, than actually risk breaking into a bank. And it's been estimated that procurement fraud you know, across the UK public sector alone, somewhere in the region of about £2.3 billion. Pounds. We estimated that the local government community actually loses nearly £850 million. Pounds. In reality, nobody actually knows exactly how much you know, we lose through, uh, public, through various forms of procurement fraud. But what it does is, you know, much needed services and programmes 
remained underfunded at a time when the economy is so volatile, we've got record inflation. Every penny, every pound that we're losing, it means that you know we may actually have to reduce the type of specification that we, we would normally require for our contracts and services. It creates doubts on whether services are actually being managed effectively. But the biggest of kind of uh, issue of all, and we just need to you know, open the newspapers or watch watch the news, is reputation, reputation, and reputation. When we're involved in a procurement fraud, it can have a huge impact on your reputations. And, and closing down procurement fraud would actually make a painless but worthwhile contribution to the UK economic re recovery. I mean, how many more nurses and doctors could, could could the NHS employ or how many free school meals could that cover? And if we were losing that £2.3 billion through procurement fraud, or it could be a lot more, it could be a lot less, but we just don't know. Therefore, I think what we want to try and emphasise today um, is that authorities really need to look at having a really good and effective anti-procurement fraud system, which in may, some authorities would already have a really effective anti procurement fraud system, but other, other authorities would actually be lacking in this or have not actually fully tested this recently. So my question, is, my question to all of you today is, you know, have you got uh, an anti-procurement fraud system in place? Uh, and such a system needs to be proportionate, pragmatic, risk-based, comprehensive, uh, tested and regularly reviewed. So some quite a few points which I've mentioned in just one sentence, but make sure that you, know, you do test and regularly review your um, kind of procurement fraud, anti-procurement fraud system. Without such a system, it's just a matter of time before somebody takes a gamble. And in many cases, it, it will actually pay off. And procurement fraud can happen throughout the procurement cycle. We're going to be looking, focusing on bid rigging, but it can happen throughout the procurement cycle, including you know, when you're writing the specification, letting of contracts, and the actual contract management phases uh, in, in the cycle. We also need to know that fraud of all kinds, including pro procurement fraud, increases during recessions, uh, when there's a particularly difficult economic climate, uh, and, and there's a growing concern that organised crime gangs actually engage in and public procurement and procurement fraud. You know, we've currently got the classic factors affecting our society. Um, and if you go back to the fraud triangle, which was developed by Professor Creasy in, in the 50s and 60s, um, you've got pressure, people are struggling to put food on the table, paying their energy bills, opportunity, and have organizations, as I said to you earlier, updated their controls since COVID, as well as rationalization. And the pressure on public finances, you know, we all know what the pressures are uh, over the next couple of years. It's going to be very important that you know, every authority actually does everything it's, it's that it can to prevent and <clears throat> detect uh, kind of procurement fraud. Uh, because what we don't want to do is end up having a, an incident involving procurement fraud, because it can be a very, very costly exercise to try to recover uh, any bus money that you've actually lost through procurement fraud. Sometimes procurement fraud is so sophisticated that it's not going to be very easy to, to actually detect. Uh, and after the event investigations can be very, very costly because of the external advisors that usually come in, in in those situations. One thing that I would really like to focus on, because I don't have a huge amount of time, is conflict of interest in procurement. It's a really a big area that colleagues and authorities really need to pay attention. And this is going to be a really kind of ramped up and reinforced under the procurement bill, which is actually currently going to go through the third reading in the House of Lords next week. And we expect to have, have this new piece of legislation, the first major piece of legis legislation after Brexit, come into force after in 2024. I would really use the procurement bill and the procurement act as a catalyst to update your internal governance procedures, check your contract procedure rules are up, up to date, uh, make sure you've got the right type of declarations and the certifications that you include in your procurement documents, and as well as separation of duties. Do start now because by the end of next year, I think it's gonna to be too late. You've gotta really start preparing as soon as we come back from the Christmas holidays in my view. Organizations also really need to take a really careful look at the skills and capacity of your procurement teams, as well as auditors and investigators. Without anybody having a really good grasp of procurement rules, it's not going to be very easy to actually detect procurement fraud. You know, if the specification has been stitched up to ensure a particular supplier wins a tender, or the evaluation criteria have been weighted in a particular way that only a particular suppliers could actually win, it's going to be very, very difficult for somebody from the outside just picking up a file to, to actually detect any irregularities. So therefore, we, are, we need to adopt a really proactive approach to you know, combating procurement fraud. It is, it is out there and possibly already in your organizations as most procurement fraud 
unfortunately involves somebody internally. Only by doing, taking a more proactive approach would we actually ensure that you know, we, we keep our organizations protected. There is no place left for strategic kind of ignorance of this area as, as, the, as basically organizations and the country can no longer afford losing money through procurement fraud. So that basically concludes my kind of quick five minute session. I'm gonna hand you back to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I just had a bit of difficulty uh, opening the uh, video and unmuting. Um, that's a great insight into, into procurement fraud and, and bid rigging. But um, what I'm now looking forward to is Richard's presentation specifically on bid rigging and where and the angle that the Competition Market Authority takes to understand a bit more about what they do, how it affects the public sector generally, and hopefully a bit more about the working relationships and the collaboration that is taking place to improve the prevention agenda around bid rigging. So I'm gonna hand you over to Richard Brown. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, can I ask if my slides are, are shared? Great, thank you very much. Um, well, firstly, thank you for, for, for having me, um, for inviting me. Um, I'm, a, as it says, um, a, a assistant director in the cartels group in the Competition and Markets Authority. A um, little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm a criminal barrister by, by way of, of training and background. I was practicing in sort of more blood and guts, I suppose, sort of law in 10, for 10 years, and then joined the government legal service, worked in the criminal part of the Attorney General's office and for what's now the National, um, the, the National Crime Agency. Um, before joining the Competition and Markets Authority in its Cartel Enforcement Division. Um, one of the things the CMA is tasked with is protecting consumers, um, stopping them being ripped off by illegal business cartels. And a, a really important part of that is stopping and investigating cartels. Um, and I think a really big um, background figure for everyone here today to bear in mind is there has been research carried out which indicates that where there is bid rigging um, in procurement that that can actually increase prices by as much as 20 percent or even more when we think about all the procurement that goes on in the public sector the amount of money that's spent that that's really significant so my aim today is to really try and un help you understand what anti-competitive behaviors in relation to procurement might look like um i hope as a result of that, you might be a better place to spot or have suspicions about behavior, about anti-competitive behavior. Um, and then if you do come across such behavior or you have suspicions, how you may be able to report this to us. So moving on to slide, second slide. Um, Perhaps a little bit of background. I'll try not to keep this quick, but what, what, what does the Competition and Markets Authority do? It's the UK's primary competition and consumer authority. We're independent from government, came into being in 2014 with the precursor organisations being the OFT, Office of Fair Trading and the Competition Commission. As you can see from the slide, we've got offices across um, the whole country, um, Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff and London, but also Manchester and Darlington offices are being developed. Um, we have a responsibility for carrying out investigations into mergers, markets, regulated industries, but also enforcing, as I said, competition and consumer law. And the law concerning cartels is seen as one of the most serious types of anti-competitive behaviour, and it is one of our key priorities. So what do I mean by a cartel? Well, um, the third slide um, sort of shows you some sort of dictionary indications. If someone could, if you could move on to the third slide, that'd be great, thank you. But I think it's important to first of all, deal with a common misconception. I'm not talking about Netflix, Ozark style um, cartels, with drug trafficking and so on, money laundering, it's something far closer to home. Um, and they involve ordinary businesses conspiring to really rig um, outcomes in procurement for their own benefit. Um, they are anti-competitive agreements between businesses. They should be competing with, uh, with each other, but instead they get together, 
they rig the bigs so that that favors their them in the market and as a result customers can be ripped off um, paying higher prices worse quality goods and services and they also stop honest businesses actually work who are trying to innovate and work hard and win the business um, legitimately from doing so um, we've seen cartels in many sectors of the economy a lot in construction it must be said I keep coming back to them but also medicines pharmaceuticals state agents financial services airlines and even amongst professional model agencies so cartels particularly the type i want to focus on today which is bid rigging um, they can be combined with other forms of criminal activity we've seen so you might see there have been instances where public officials receive financial or other rewards um, again in holidays um, employment some sort of uh, home improvements perhaps even um, and that's in return for awarding contracts um, to a preferred bidder so the, the sort of corrupt public official i'm not saying this happens the whole time but far from it but but if there is one that that they can facilitate the operation and the continuation or the stability of a bid rigging cartel. Um, we also ha have uncovered evidence of what could be described as dodgy payments. So we uh, more perhaps legally talk, call them compensation payments, um, or, and they can even be referred to as drinks money we've seen in chats. And this is where a company who submitted a deliberately high bid is compensated for by the winning bidder for not competing against them. And that can actually, that sort of transfer of money can occur under the cover of false invoices we've seen. Um, and sometimes the payment is just made in cash or they operate a sort of slate system. Um, as a result of that and other reasons, we operate closely with other agencies, um, particularly Serious Fraud Office and also City of London Police and, and indeed HMRC. Um, as as has already been uh, um, mentioned, we think there is actually an increased risk of cartels at the moment because of the economic um, situation, uncertainty, the results of the pandemic. Um, and as again I said, uh, I think it's accepted that corruption, fraud risks increase in times of change and uncertainty um, and bid rigging is, is no different. Um, moving on to the next slide, so it's obviously, as I've already mentioned, a key risk, we think, in public procurement. Um, it's very significant public procurement economically. It represents, as I said, about a third of all UK public expenditure, covers a large range of markets and goods and services, um, and a very large amount of money is spent on it. Um, so the potential, the potential harm, but also the potential gains for those involved in it from bid rigging becomes evident. Um, but that would be felt throughout society, um, taxpayers, all of us use public infrastructure and services. And if we're denied the benefits of competition in relation to that, that has an inverse adverse impact on us all. Um, so that's why I'm really here talking today. We want everybody to be high, high, on high alert about it. Um, moving on to the next slide. So we've been trying to increase our capabilities since um, 2014 to ensure that we can properly investigate and enforce um, against cartels. So we've got a number of tools and procedures in place to uncover the cartels and to progress our cases as swiftly as we can. We started to see the results of that. So in the last two years, we've issued fines of over 76 million against companies involved. Um, we have the power to find companies up to 10% of their worldwide turnover. And also we've taken action against individuals. So 24 people have been disqualified from acting as directors and two people have actually been given criminal convictions. Um, so it's also worth being aware that businesses involved who are found to have been involved in cartels can face damages claims by third parties. So the customers who of those um, who were receiving the services subject to the cartel, that includes government. Um, and that's an increasingly significant aspect of cartel enforcement. Um, and it goes back so you can, um, these sort of actions can take place many years, not only after a decision by the CMA, but even further, looking further back, the conduct itself you could be 10 years after the conduct itself 
there's also obviously a huge reputational harm to companies being involved. Yet despite this, it seems that competition law is very low on boardroom agendas. Um, and that's again why why I'm out here today trying to um, make people more not um, aware of, of what, what cartel activity is and the risks from it. We do have strong um, powers in investigation as set out on this next slide. Um, and they, I think, uh, make it clear that the risks of getting caught are, are very real. So these powers of investigation um, allow us to turn up with a warrant to search premises that could be commercial premises um, or actually the domestic premises of individuals who we suspect being involved in the cartel behaviour. Um, we can interview people using compulsory or voluntary powers and we can compel companies to give us information um, or documents. So we've also got added to that, um, perhaps more, I know some people provide them a sort of line of duty, sneaky beaky style um, uh, powers under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000. Many of you I'm sure are aware of that act. So we've got surveillance that includes following and, and monitoring suspects and covertly recording conversations and meetings. Um, we can use informants, um, covert human intelligence sources, uh, and we can also access communications data to gain evidence. Um, I agree that I understand that this might seem a, li a little sort of line of duty as I've said, but we do use these powers and increasingly our cases, I think about half our cases are now intelligence led by, um, and using those powers to build up a case and then open a case and start investigating more openly. But what, what is a cartel, um, I suppose, is, is a question many, some of you may be asking. Well, um, you, there are certain basics that factors that they all have in common. The main, main one, again, I set out in the next slide, is that they undermine competition and that they essentially cheat customers of a fair deal. Um, there are three common types of cartel conduct as set out here. So you've got price fixing, um, which really is what it says on the tin. Um, competitors agreeing to fix their prices, what prices they're going to bid, bid at, um, but, but, it, but it could also be just what they're going to charge, and they could also do it for target bans or agreeing not to discount before a certain, below a certain level. Secondly, you've got market sharing, um, where they illegally divide up a market between them. In other words, you do this area, we'll do that area, we won't go into each other's areas. And then third, you've got bid rigging. So that's where they rig the bids, as it might say, um, who's going to win a competitive tender and at what price, really. Um, so I'm going to focus more on, as I've already done so, on the bid rigging aspect um, and that's broken down a bit more in this next slide. So it does come in a, a variety of forms. They're all designed to manipulate the tender process. Um, and really is important that procurers do recognize these different forms and then they can stay alive perhaps to the fact that they may be ongoing or the red flags that they may be happening that may be going on. So you've got bid rotation. So the companies agreeing to take it in turns to submit the lowest bid so that they become the most attractive bid generally, that's the case, and thus ensuring that they will have a fair share of the market as they see it. Cover pricing. Maybe a situation where companies don't want to win a bid, but at the same time for many reasons decide they don't, they still want to put in a tender. Um, and so they, they communicate that to their competitors and they agree to submit an inflated cover bid so that they don't, there's no chance they actually do win the, win the work and that somebody else maximizes their opportunities to do so. We've got bid suppression. They agree, um, a company may say, okay, this time I just won't submit a bid at all. So other firms obviously let face less competition. And this is normally injured, done, very often done for some sort of kickback or payment as I alluded to before. And then you might find a situation where the company that won subcontracts some of the work to the company that didn't enter a bid. And then we've got customer or market allocation um, so there, there's a division of the customers or geographic areas, as I said before, and that's sort of in sort of in, interlinked with the bid rigging itself. Um, so you might have a sort of you know, north, south, east, west, and four companies that predominantly supplying in one of those areas, even though they could all um, actually cover nationally. 
Um, and as I said, this can lead to artificially inflated prices, receiving poor, poorer quality services, um, and if they had actually competed properly in the tender process. So how about some examples? Um, first of all, um, I wanted to touch on this um, sector, the office fit out sector. It affected, a, um, amongst others, a further education college in East London. Um, it began when the companies, our investigation began when the companies, con one of the companies contacted the CMA to admit their involvement. They, as a result, avoided a fine under our leniency program. It concerned this case several businesses. They were cover bidding for bids, as, as it may be clear, to fit out and refurbish offices. Um, so this was, um, this, this cover bidding meant that clients, as mentioned, in, included a further education college. They missed out on their opportunities to get the best possible deals. Um, important, quite high value contracts. Um, and, and this type of sort of cover bidding is illegal under competition law. So we find the companies a total of over seven million pounds. In each case, the fine was increased because one or more of the directors of the company were actually directly involved in the conduct. Um, and I think we secured direct cost disqualification against six directors of the companies involved. Um, I should actually add that during the course of this investigation, we did come across examples where it would appear the external client project managers didn't seem to have done their job as well as they could have in order to secure value for money for their clients. Um, we think that they may have asked one supplier to recommend two other suppliers to take part in the bid. Um, and it, from that, it's pretty, pretty clear or pretty, pretty easy to guess what, what then happened. The supplier who contacted the other two um, just asked them to provide cover bids. So moving on to the next slide, this actually is just some of the evidence we uncovered in the in this case. It's a, an email. The first one is an internal email in which um, one, an estimator is emailing his managing director and the estimator has prepared an inflated bid um, and asking the MD to, to send it to a competitor and tell them to make it look like their own bid. Pretty blatant um, disregard for the rules. So you've got the second email, and that's between two competitors or so-called competitors. It's telling one telling the other to submit a rubbish quote and give the appearance of a competitive bid. We see this sort of evidence regularly in our cases, either in the form of emails or, or chat messages on phones. Moving on to a further example, it's a case I was involved in. Um, it, it involved um, three construction firms um, they fined more than 36 million for breaking competition law and this was in relation to concrete drainage products um, you know these are drainage pipes crucial importance to large infrastructure projects uh, i during the course of the investigation i saw them being laid all around me um, on my my journey to work um, it, it would comprise the agreements in this case um, three key aspects Firstly, we had situations where they agreed to fix or coordinate their spot market prices. And then they'd give the lists that had been agreed to their own internal staff to deal with customers. Secondly, they shared their market by allocating customers. And thirdly, um, they would exchange competitively, sens competitively sensitive information. So these, these arrangements were carried out or agreed um, in, in secret meetings attended by senior executives, directors from each firm. Um, they had a number of these meetings and we actually recorded a number of them as well. And that was very important and um, um, vivid evidence for us when we came arriving at our final decision. Um, so as I said, these, these were if you think about it, universal products, really important. They, their clients include engineering, construction firms, utility providers, local and national governments across Great Britain could, could be using the, their products. Um, directors were disqualified um, and actually a criminal conviction was secured. Again, just a flavor of the evidence is set out on the next case, the next slide. Um, um, there were, um, sorry, I've just been asked to do something on technology, but I'll, I'll hopefully I'll carry on, it'll be okay. Um, so we have the, 
price fixing evidence here. And this is a quote from one of the, the meetings. Um, guys, look, look at our financial numbers. We've all had a good year and that's come about by us all sitting here. So that's really blatant and you might feel cynical um, disregard for what for for what should be normal competitive procedures. Um, those meetings were held away from business premises. They're in hotel meeting rooms, um, and one of the the people involved of it had a folder in which he um, titled "Boys Spoils File," and another um, referred to the arrangement in correspondence as being the Pigeon Club. Sort of, so not really normal commercial um, language you should expect. Moving on to the next slide. So this is a current case. Um, again, I'm involved in it. It is something I must say right from the start is provisional. Um, it's of, um, as a result, our findings, as I said, are provisional. We haven't um, sort of come to a final decision. So we're still considering reps, but we have issued our, our provisional fi findings. Um, and the, the it's to do with demolition firms. Again, an important part of um, construction industry. Um, you can see their work uh, across the country. Um, we had found that in relation to 19 contracts, of, of a, some of them of a very significant nature, um, that there has been collusion between companies. Eight of the companies we've had um, issued fi um, provisional findings of have admitted their participation. Two are currently contesting. I said the companies are on the case is ongoing, and we are in the process of um, considering their representations. But it was a very large um, case in, scale, in terms of scale and complexity, um, and we conducted um, inspections at a number of sites, interviewed large people using a various. Um, degrees of our powers and I said so set out there some of the the contracts involve well-known sites so you've got the Met Police Training Centre, um, Oxford University, um, Selfridges sites as well so and real mixture of public and private. So what what can you do to reduce your chances of being a victim of bid rigging? Um, well I set out here there are four steps be aware of what it is and be alert to the fact that it, it does happen. Um, design and manage your procurement process in a way that reduces the risk. Um, and, and that's something I'll perhaps touch on a bit later, but it, it, it's, it's sort of to do with thinking about how you may be vulnerable to the bid rigging um, behaviors I've set out before. Um, recognizing and thinking about red flags um, these are the kinds of suspect activities and patterns of behavior that might suggest bid rigging. You may just see one aspect of it, and I'll, I'll come to the, them in a bit more detail, but, but we may know a bit more about that industry and in conjunction, it could begin to sort of piece together the, the, um, the, the picture for us. Uh, and finally, we want you to know how you to report suspicious activity. Um, we very much encourage people to come forward and, and do report suspicious activity. Um, and really one very important point is if you do have suspicions that your suppliers may be involved, um, do not confront them, come to us. If you do confront them, it might result in the suppliers being tipped off and that makes our job of investigating um, much harder. Um, so here are some of the common red flags for you to think about. Um, sorry, um, First of all, sorry, if you can go back to the, the previous slide, thank you. Um, they are, I said, they're very much, you can see these in isolations, but you might, for instance, see identical bids, perhaps for individual line items, or maybe the, you can see similar wording, spelling mistakes, or calculations. You might have higher bids than you were expecting, um, with no real logical um, reason for some of the cost differences between bids. Um, they may actually contain conversely less detail than you're expecting. You could see track changes, which seem a bit odd, um, perhaps involvement of someone who you wouldn't expect on the bid, or there is a very big gap between the winning bid in terms of price and the others that were submitted. Um, you may also see where you change um, the terms, the scope of a procurement, 
um, process um, that suddenly that relate that produces a, a, a very similar change to the original bids amongst the parties um, or, or you may actually get fewer bids than you were logically expecting um, you may again have um, bids being submitted um, in a process in a pattern developing in which they all the, the regular bidders seem to be um, winning um, each one's winning in in a sort of fair allocated share as they might see it um, or lowest bidders may actually at the end up saying actually no we don't want this job and rejecting the contract so we've seen all of those sorts of things in our, in our investigations none of them are a silver bullet to confirm that bid rigging is taking place but we would ask that you just think stop if you do see one of them and think is this something we were expecting does it raise suspicions in your mind um, so if it does as i've said very much encourage you to come and speak to us it may already be that we hold some information about it so moving on to the next slide um, the way the freight, the way a procurement um, process is designed, can in some instances increase the risk of bid rigging, um, and it makes that's because it makes collusion easier between competitors. Um, that particularly where it limits the number of eligible bidders, for example, as part of a limited process intended to increase the speed of procurement, or it, it, if it limits the number of eligible bidders through restrictive pre-qualification criteria. It might favor perhaps inc incumbents um, or it might create predictable cycles of procurement. Um, and so there is, and many of you I'm sure are aware of this, best, many best practice models out there. Um, and, but we recommend you to um, be familiar with the Cabinet Office Outsourcing Playbook. Um, the CMA has been working closely with the Cabinet Office in relation to that and, and that the risks of bid rigging are reflected in that playbook. Um, and also don't let your suppliers, your suppliers um, don't be afraid to let them know that you are um, looking out and being vigilant for signs of bid rigging. You can actually tell them you're actively monitoring bids um, and obviously in your tender documentations obtaining signed declarations about non-collusion is very important. Moving on to the next slide, I'm conscious of time. I hope I'm not overreaching myself. Um, no, you're good, Richard. You can carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Or maybe only another five minutes, I think. Um, so one other thing I do want to highlight, though, is, is that the CMA is very keen to work with local procurement teams and local fraud teams to share intelligence and data. You're the ones on the ground and you're going to come across the suspicious behavior but but we do actually also receive quite a lot of information which may be relevant um, to your areas uh, and companies and individuals that may be working in your area so if we work and develop together our collaborative working relationships we think um, we, we that that can help everyone um, we're also seeking to work collaboratively with large procurement organizations um, really to sort of develop research projects on data analysis to help identify um, suspicious bidder activity. So we could build on the CMA's prior experience in this area and we've got a strong data science function and we're seeking access to large scale detailed data, significant volumes um, of procurement exercises. So that's really we're looking for where it involves or includes data on all bidders successful um, or unsuccessful and, and our aim is to conduct analysis using advanced analytical methods I don't really understand them at all myself personally but there are many in the CMA who do um, and that's to try and identify sort of patterns in bidder activity that may be the result of suspicious behavior so that is all really working towards getting a toolkit I suppose of data driven methods and tools that all procurement bodies or many procurement bodies can use to improve their identification of bidder collusion. Um, and so if you are interested in that, we, we would be welcome to discuss this work with you. Um, and we're also very happy to come and talk to any local or regional procurement or fraud teams about how we might be able to work together and take that forward collaboratively. Um, so a bit more about where to find out more about us. We do have, as set out on this next slide, um, a lot of information 
um, on a, our, our, our website, in particular on our page, our cheating or competing campaign page. And that helps, we help hope to people to deter, um, detect and report um, illegal anti-competitive practices. Um, we've also got a dedicated section on that page for public procurers, and that includes a free e-learning tool. It's designed specifically for public sector um, procurers. I think the module takes about 30 minutes to complete. There's a quick guide for public sector procurers on how to spot, deter, and report suspect activity. Um, and we also have animated videos that explain behaviors that are illegal under competition law. Um, so, there, so there's a wealth of uh, material there, case studies um, and examples are more going more detail than I've covered today about um, the, our investigations and the consequences for businesses who are involved in them and individuals. And then second last slide, we're glad to hear, glad to hear um, obviously it's really important that you know how to report any suspicions you have. Um, we've got a, a, num a number, dedicated number are set out here our sort of bat cartels, Batman hotline, um, and also an email um, address for you to, to um, report any, any suspicions that you might have. And as I said, we strongly encourage you to do so. So that was a bit of a whistle stop to uh, through what's quite a, a large area for us, obviously, but I know it's just one factor that you, you all have to consider along with many others. But um, with that in mind, um, unless I'll go back to Mark and perhaps Mark can marshal any questions that, that yeah, anybody might have. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. That was really interesting. We've got quite a few questions, so um, we might be uh, taking up your time for the rest of the 15 minutes, which is which is great. Um, I really liked the e-learning guidance and the, um, uh, the e-learning and the guidance is available on your web page. I think the fact that um, maybe not all public sector organisations uh, knew that was available. I think you're now going to have an influx of people undertaking the e-learning. I would certainly encourage every organisation to get their procurement professionals to uh, undertake the e-learning module. It's, if it's free, why not um, utilise it? Um, that's that's great. A couple of questions that have been posted through. Um, you mentioned collusion cases uh, in your presentation and uh, Michelle has asked, over what period of time? Um, we're, we're talking years. Um, you know, it, it can, it, they can, once a cartel, from what I've seen, what a car, once a cartel is ex established amongst a, a group of suppliers, um, it, can, it can go on for years. And you mentioned uh, the CMA's work on digital forensics. Um, a couple of people have asked, but James Hayes asked in the uh, Q&A box, does the CMA feed into the data, uh, National Fraud Initiative, which is the national data matching exercise run by the Cabinet Office? I personally do not know that. Um, it sounds like the sort of thing we would, would be, but I, I, will, I can go away and check on that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, someone's asked, where do the fines go? So if, if, you're, if you're recouping money and the fines are paid, uh, do they go into a central government pot? Does the CMA get a share to reinvest in activity, etc.? I, I think, I, I mean, I suppose that's sort of linked to a sort of, you know, poker style um, question, what happens to, <laughs> to fines. I, I think, and I may be correct, this is not an area I I'm generally deal with, but um, I think they actually go into the central. It's not like a, a, a poker scheme. Okay. You mentioned the uh, Cabinet Office playbook. We've looked. It's available free online to download. What we will do at, at SITFRA is make sure that when we send the slides out, we'll send a link to that out. So anyone that's interested right. in going and, 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 and downloading that, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, do you think, in your personal opinion, do you think the penalties are sufficient to deter bid rigging? Um, whether that's the financial penalties or the disqualifications? I, I do. I mean, I think 10% of um, a company's worldwide turnover, up to 10%, is a very significant amount, um, potentially. Uh, and I, I think you can't see them in isolation, actually. We, it's, there's been a real emphasis in the CMA in the, la in the last few years, actually, with making per individuals involved, directors involved, have personal consequences so um, we've had now we 
we can consider in all our cases whether direct disqualifications is an appropriate route to go down and it's really our enforcement of that has really ramped up and the periods that people are being disqualified for are significant again we're talking about years here five um, seven nine ten years that sort of period um, so i think all combined yes um, there is also the potential um, for criminal cartel um, cr um, offences as well and we've had two individuals um, and found um, have got convictions as well in relation to that so again significant i think and then and then linked to that we've uh, had one around technology is there any technology available that can be used by public sector organizations to identify or prevent bid rigging um i presume that's something similar to um putting controls in place to, that would uh, for early identification of the red flags and and also the use of the technology to identify the relationships or links between disqualified directors and uh, recent bids and tenders and, and individuals involved in those. I'm I must say I'm not aware of any sort of you know central database or anything like that um, in that way. Um, we we but I do I think there is in time, and it's going through at the moment with the procurement um, bill. I think there is moves a foot um, under that for there to be a sort of central database and there is increase if, if someone if a company is found to be um, infringing comp and competition law or cartel laws then they will go on to a um, they will be there's more mandatory prohibitions from them carrying out public sector work or bidding for them and actually there is um, moves afoot for there to be a central database list for them to go on as well um so that, that that could become available um i just obviously who knows when things go through parliament they may change but that that as i understand is something that's going on at the moment um in terms of uh, other uh, stephen stephen Bauer, one of our guests uh, one of our, uh, our delegates has actually asked if there's a list of all companies that have been involved in bid rigging so they could be excluded from the government procurement uh, process not at the moment but that that may be changing as i understand um and 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 the whole mandatory ban the pro that's very much being tightened up under, under this legislation mm. i think um the but in terms of sort of other tools i'm not aware of there being anything um but that's certainly something which obviously if there was to become that's something we would be very interested in in, in doing or hopefully being able to help develop if there was such a tool in in, in thought of doing so and as a discussed we are very keen to try and look at um, you know, analytics, um, that sort of thing, to when to help with um, spotting the behaviours that I've talked about. You mentioned um, working together with public sector organisations around the dig digital forensics and and what can be done. Mohammed, is that something that we could get involved with in regards to the procurement network? um setting up forums or working groups and it or, or or a relationship between a cma and our members in order to to facilitate that uh, very, very much so because in terms of what rich has outlined it's, it's it is a very complex sophisticated area and <clears throat> any support colleagues can get on the ground in terms of procurement officers they're not kind of competition law experts they're not kind of uh, fraud experts so it would be very useful and in terms of data analysis and uh, analytics it's going to be very important, especially with the new procurement bill, which is going to have more open data. But at the same time, I think it, I think Richard's session just outlines the importance of pre-market engagement, uh, making sure you have a very you know comprehensive due diligence process as part of your selection process. Often we see because of capacity issues, authorities just use it as a tick box exercise. We've got to really make it really effective so that you know, we we can actually weed out some of these suppliers and directors who've actually been involved in some you know questionable practices in the past. It's a difficult subject because you know you're not able to access data you know from a national database. There is going to be a debarment list that will be developed, but when it's developed, we'll have to wait and see. It could be years away, and there's going to be lots of GDPR issues as well. So this is a very complex area that we, we're actually dealing with, and We've got to make sure that you know nobody does anything that, that breaches anybody's kind of personal data so it's a mm -hmm. it's a tough area but a collaboration will support authorities and richard in light of the recent covid fraud from the bogus companies um and companies house rules changing in regards to directors being made more robust um will the cma be feeding into that process uh, whether it's just advice, guidance, or, or or sort of a way forward, 
so in relation to sort of um, the, the rules around company directors and yes. who can, well, I, I mean, our role is slightly different. I, I think we really do concentrate on, on company directors and anti-competitive behavior. So we have a very established regime in relation to that and legal principles and statute. Um, so I don't think there's there's particular role for us on that. But obviously, if there's any, if if people were asked to sort of guidance system, you know, how our system works, for instance, and, and how the process works, of course, that's something we'd feed into, certainly. And there's a couple of questions probably grouped together around how, how difficult it is to detect bid rigging and procurement fraud in general. Um, we've had one around, so you gave a, a, an example, a case study of 10 companies that have been identified in, a, in, a, in, in bid rigging. Um, is there anything done reconciliation wise? Because there's a transparency agenda and public sector organisations um, uh, uh, put out publicly who their contracts are with. Has anything been done to retrospectively go back and look at where any of these companies may have had public sector contracts? I mean, obviously, our investigations can be really wide ranging um, and they can take many years and they can involve often more than one contract. So as part, they, as part of the investigation, such public sector contracts may may come up. Um, mm. But once we've done a decision, we you know, published it, we, we ourselves don't you know, actively go back and then look again at other contracts because our investigation is finished unless of course we get further information which indicates that there is suspicious behavior around other contracts then that's something we'd then have to consider um, but as a and what's just popped into my head is about third party damage claims um, you know all our investigations are out there on our, our website parties are named it, it is there available for others to to think of, to look into it and then perhaps you know they will have their own data and to look at it and go, oh, do we have any suspicions about this? You know, they're, they're, those are steps, but that's something which we wouldn't, you know, if it's not on our radar, we ourselves wouldn't be able to go back to unless further information comes to us. And then, and then um, again, it's been raised that it's, it's where it's difficult to detect and internal bid rigging is probably even harder to detect um, and relies heavily on whistleblowing. We've got some questions around guidance and toolkits available uh, to establish what is an abnormally low bid, for instance, whether they can see these these uh, red flags um, more easier. Well, is there any particular, sorry, any particular toolkits available yeah. for people? Yeah, so, so uh, Ashok um, has asked, is there any guidance toolkit available to procurers to establish what is an abnormally low uh, bid price? That's obviously in relation to the cartels, something that's, that's coming yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... I mean, it's obviously it's very it's quite difficult to talk in the abstract um, about it. But if you had a, it's more as the person you know involved in running the bidding process. If you get a, a large number of bids in and there's one which is really low um, compared to the others, or as it's a lot cheaper, then that you know that that I don't know it might and and it, it get some suspicions going in in someone's mind, particularly and if if you've had experience of these companies putting bids in before. And you haven't seen that before. Yeah, you know, that seems a rather odd behaviour. Why? Why are the costs so much lower for this company than the others? Um, that again, not just just set alarm bells ringing. But there's no. So it is very. There is a lot of feel and experience, but no doubt. I think actually a number of people on this webinar may have have that feel, ability to feel and experience. And it's it's almost like when you write a, a word, a spelling, you know, that little alarm bell goes. You've written, hang on, that just, just doesn't quite look right. Just a few more before we before we wrap up. Um, uh, Lindsay Roberts has asked, do we publish data on the dodgy suppliers? I think that's already been answered in it, so the organisations could use, use that as part of the due diligence process. Yeah. Um, Peter Barker wants to know how he can get a job at the CMA. He's never seen any on the civil service jobs. It sounds fascinating <laughs> work. Um, I think they are they are quite regularly out there being published. So, so I, can't, I can't really help with that, I'm afraid. Um, Simon Hagen has asked, did the CMA work alongside police and fraud squads? I think uh, in the public sector, we, we obviously um, experience uh, um, a lot of instances where the police are unable to assist us or don't have the uh, either the capacity or the appropriately qualified staff. How have you found that with the work that you do? Uh, 
I think it's a, there's no doubt cartel behavior is a very distinct area of the law and area of offending and sometimes I think you know you again we're doing a bit of sort of outreach to say look it, it's a form of fraud you know it can be a form of fraud and increasingly I think other organizations are, are becoming more alive to it certainly and that's something that they they need to contact us if they 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 have suspicions brought to their minds but but even sort of vice versa today if people um as a result of this or other um educational tools they use are themselves becoming more aware of this sort of behavior being potentially bid rigging um, anti-competitive behavior that that our, our involvement our our area of expertise on it mm -hmm. if that's drawn to the attention of the, of the other body you're talking to that's always helpful as well um, as you can imagine we've had a whole whole host of questions around this um, a lot of people are very um, uh, interested in what's been going on and have um, questions that I would like answered. We don't have time, unfortunately, to ask them all. So if you've asked a question and it hasn't been answered, uh, I apologise. We will share any other questions that are outstanding to see if we can get um, some feedback um, that we can share with you when we send out slides and our links. I would like to thank the uh, delegates for attending, over 140 of you, as you can imagine, um, that is considered very successful in terms of webinar numbers. So we appreciate that and please look out for, for future webinars hosted by SIPFA. Um, but I would particularly like to thank Mohammed and Richard for their contribution today. Um, it's been great. It's been very interesting. Um, thank you both. And I look forward to the next one. Thank you very much. Thank, you. Pleasure. thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions.